so song from 1974 Pablo Milanes. Uh, I think that the music, the, the music of this era and the, the songs and the poetry and the artists of this era are actually a, a good way to get into the, the mood or to, to figure out what people were inspired by at this time. And uh, some of you uh, focused in on this. I think Lydia, you quoted from uh, Stern, this uh, block quote on page 274 of Santa Bria that talks about the importance of memory of, you know, of, of this idea that these, they, that the human rights uh, are, are, are things that just because of the context of the times, they, they can't, they, you can't just say that, that the human rights should be abrogated or that should have disappeared. And so again, this is, uh, this takes us back to this idea that of, of remembering these times and understand and the idea from from Milanes is that he's going to come back and sort of restore justice uh, to this place while remembering those that have disappeared, those that are absent uh, and, and gave their life to the struggle. So um, I think that this, this, this song and this theme uh, take us into this idea that for a lot of people who either went to Latin America and the Caribbean to study or may have traveled there or who became interested in this place, they were particularly struck by a number of things. One is, uh, and I guess I'm, I'm thinking especially of people coming from the United States and uh, some European countries into Latin America, people would be especially struck by the inequalities in traveling between what was the United States and landing uh, in Latin America and, and the relationship between these two. People were also struck by the inequality within Latin American and Caribbean countries. So for example, in Brazil, uh, which is sort of in some ways famous for having some extremely poor marginalized sectors of society. We talked in the last class about uh, the Nancy Shepard Hughes book, Death Without Weeping and about infant mortality in Northeast Brazil. I mean, some of the, the, the truly worst conditions one can imagine uh, in Brazil, but at the same time, some of the wealthiest people, some of the wealthiest individuals and some of the most ostentatious displays of wealth are people who would be able to jet set between Miami and whatever Latin American country they were in. So there'd be an enormous inequality gulf, which is true in the United States and probably in some ways in the last few, in the last decade or so, the United States has become as unequal as the places that we used to criticize for being so unequal. Uh, but it was sort of on vivid display in many Latin American and Caribbean countries that there'd be sort of these high rise luxury apartments right next to, uh, you know, these uh, very uh, impoverished sectors. And so people were struck by both the inequality between the United States, but also within these countries themselves. We talked about this in terms of colonialism, but the legacy of violence, the divisions based on race and ethnicity, the violence against indigenous people uh, that continued in the, in the national independence period, uh, again, vividly in some ways on display in Latin America. Again, we know this from the United States in terms of the US Civil War and the legacy of slavery, but uh, it was in, in some ways played out uh, very strongly in, in different parts of Latin America. The other thing is people, as we, we, simp we just saw this sort of military rule, the dictatorships, uh, coups that were undertaken, and then uh, the persecution of those who would might have been involved in progressive movements. Uh, so uh, the state and the police force and the military. Uh, in many Latin American countries, the police or the military would be the last people you would want to see uh, because you knew that things were going to go. Things things would be going very bad for you. Now, of course, again in the United States, we've thankfully realize in recent years that this is happening too in, in the sort of policing of uh, black communities. Uh, 
but certainly in Latin America, uh, this was something that the people, you would never assume that the state was sort of out to protect you necessarily because they were often involved in these kinds of disappearings uh, of, of, uh, of protesters, as well as simply uh, uh, just uh, exercising violence upon the population. The other thing that people would, would realize immediately is, is the way in which the United States was often involved in these things. We'll talk later about how the United States was often taking the side of the, of the government or the side of the military, providing training for the military, providing training for the police, uh, offering a haven for people who want to park their money and assets outside of the country. Um, you'd, you'd be there, uh, you know, you might, might remember quite vividly being in Ecuador and, you know, seeing the U.S. Embassy and it's all guarded in by barbed wire and has this sort of beautiful place. And that's where I could go into as a citizen, but you'd go in and you'd see a room full of people who are trying to, to get a visa or immigrate or migrate out. And, you know, and you'd go back as a citizen into this other special room. And, you know, it was just, it was just very vivid, the side that the United States seemed to be occupying and the side the United States seemed to be playing was that of, you know, supporting landholders, uh, often oppressive governments. And, you know, in general, I would say that the, that the people who were studying here would notice that, that the United States government seemed to be supporting some of the, the reactionary elements of the population. So what this kind of added up to in many cases during, the, during the, these periods, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, is movements of solidarity between people. Uh, so often in the United States, people would, would try to band together to change the laws or to change the government in the United States or to offer help to those in Latin American and Caribbean countries. So we see the efforts of say groups like Amnesty International or Witness for Peace is, is still quite active. Um, you know, and I think that uh, Lydia found U2 playing in Argentina. That's kind of a, a sort of contemporary manifestation or Bruce Springsteen going down to Chile to play concert. And you're sort of stating that yourself in solidarity with the elements of, 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 of protest and of, of, of those seeking for justice from the United States. Also an interesting thing happened in the, in the Catholic church which was the adoption of, of the idea that Santa Maria talks about of liberation theology. And this sort of came, came up a lot in the 1970s and 1980s, has probably since receded somewhat. But the idea was that the, the church needed to kind of throw itself or take the side of the poor. And this led to, in, in many countries, uh, people in the church, uh, even priests joining, even in some cases joining revolutionary movements, the idea was that Jesus and the Bible dictated that really the church would, should be on the side of the poor, not on the side of the wealthy. Um, in some ways, the mission, the movie, the film, we, we that was the first thing we watched maybe, or second, was based upon this idea that, you know, the church was siding with the poor, siding with the indigenous, siding with the most oppressed, and shouldn't be the necessarily the, the instrument of the wealthy or the instrument of the government. Um, this was liberation theology itself led to some pretty serious schisms within the church, and uh, people were not all excited about this move uh, throughout uh, Europe and Latin America, but it was an interesting... Um, it was an interesting pivot, uh, which, which merged with the idea that we talked about of popular Catholicism and how sometimes religion could be a critique of, uh, of the social order. So that in many ways, the researchers studying Latin America seemed to feel that there was a, a tendency or a, uh, a, a sort of, uh, that they were good at, they seem to be better at doing 
resistance and rebellion and revolution. They seem to do that better than in the United States. And many people got, uh, how to say, excited about that or, or, um, or saw themselves in solidarity with some of the movements there. Um, you know, I mean, I think some people in the United States have been disappointed, for example, that there has never been a very large movement of a very large labor movement. Um, and so in many Latin American countries, when they would have go on strike or have a, a or have a, a, a movement, you, you could almost shut down the entire country uh, by having a, a transportation strike. And, you know, I mean, it's sort of, in some ways it's, it's, it's one of the things that's unimaginable almost in the United States, although we're starting to imagine it, and we saw it a little bit in the last year that, you know, I mean, if you shut down one highway, it would, it, people get extremely upset. And so, you know, I mean, it was this idea that in some ways these things were more possible in Latin America than they were in the United States. I also would like to mention here that uh, Santa Bria talks about how in some ways anthropologists in general may have missed some of this stuff. So anthropologists would be off studying kinship or uh, gender, or, you know, anthropological things. And oftentimes we miss these social transformations of the large things. We talked about this when we talked about uh, anthropology and nationalism, that in some ways anthropologists prided themselves on being off among relatively isolated peoples. And so they kind of missed these larger ideas in society. There was actually a very famous article by uh, Steve Stern, who he quoted before, uh, that was said, that talked about missing the revolution in Peru. And it was like, you know, what were anthropologists doing? I'll say here at Hartwick College, uh, our anthropologists are very into this stuff. If you've ever taken a course with uh, Professor Woost that's probably titled Resistance, Rebellion, Revolution, or the Anthropology of Violence, or Professor Anderson uh, just a few hours ago is teaching a J-term course on the Anthropology of War. So uh, at least here at Hartwick, we're pretty up on our, our violence, revolution, resistance, war, all that all that good stuff. Um, but sometimes uh, anthropology was off in, the, in studying other things and missing this idea. Now, there, one of the things that, that sort of inspired the revolutionary impetus, you might say, in uh, Latin America, is that when we think about the revolution in the United States, we might think back to 1776, and the, you know, the independence, the revolutionary movement, but then revolution in the United States was pretty much over and forgotten and, and nobody really wants to talk about uh, having a kind of revolution in the United States anymore. But in Latin America, there were a couple of revolutions that inspired other people and were relatively more recent and so could perhaps not be called upon as examples. So Mexico, uh, we talked about, had been had uh, acquired its independence, but later on, about a hundred years ago, uh, went through a, a tumultuous period that became later known as the Mexican Revolution because it, in some ways, worked, uh, and it was a rebellion against an elite class uh, led mostly by people. I said peasants, but you know, mostly by agriculturalists mostly by people who were outside of the elite and afterward are able to kind of seize control of the state and create a Mexican national identity. Um, as we saw in the, in the, the film, um, like Water for Chocolate, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that everybody's lives were completely transformed. Uh, in some ways, those ranch owners seem to still be able to have nice parties and, and they're still servants and they're still uh, the social class order. But a lot of people's lives did uh, alter in the sense that uh, there was a, a new, how to say, a new, a new elite class, a different idea about how we need to identify more as Mexican. 
uh, perhaps even as uh, as um, as socialist, you might say. It also produced a couple of of folk heroes. So here are a picture of two of the most famous uh, revolutionaries. I mentioned uh, Pancho Villa in the north. Uh, in like water for chocolate, those are they refer to them as Villistas who are riding in on horseback, so they would be followers of Pancho Villa. And in the south, Emiliano Zapata, who was more known as kind of a, you know, sort of indigenous agricultural peasant type. So Villa was was known as a kind of northern, maybe more like a bandit. And uh, and in fact, I think he, he is the, the source of, of popular banditry, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, narratives. Whereas Zapata was seen as, as more rooted in his community, even though they were both uh, on, uh, ended up being the leaders of significant uh, revolutionary armies. And they, uh, they eventually ride into Mexico City and, and are able to take power. And so there's a picture of them when they kind of are able to join up and ride into the, to the state and, and seize power uh, and, and basically proclaim that they've won the Mexican Revolution. They won control of the state. My teacher in Latin America, when I took Latin American history, claimed that, I don't know if you can if see it in this picture, he claimed that Pancho Villa in this picture looks more like he's like, yeah, we're here. We did it. I'm ready to go. Yeah, we're taking over. And that Zapata is more like, huh, time to kind of get back home. Got to get those crops planted that he's less, uh, he's, he's much more timid. But this is a very famous picture of uh, Villa and Zapata when they, they meet up in Mexico City and uh, have basically celebrating the, their successes. Um, well, I, should, I, I think I told you that, that Santa Bria basically, I can't even find references to the Mexican Revolution in Santa Bria, which is odd because it, it was a very inspirational uh, revolution throughout Latin America. A second inspirational revolution, of course, is the Cuban Revolution. We've talked about this on and off throughout the class, which created the first, perhaps the only truly uh, socialist, I say truly in the sense of being allied with the, the ideas of, of Marxism and Leninism uh, in, the, in the Americas. Certainly the, the first one that was able to successfully uh, overthrow the ruling class and create a, a very different um, society. Um, also created a couple of folk heroes who are, you know, these are uh, very famous portraits or pictures of Fidel Castro at the top and then uh, Che Guevara, uh, the, who are, see, uh, he's, he's originally from Argentina, but there's Castro up there. And uh, I, I guess I would also want to mention here that, that a lot of people think that, you know, Castro was always against the United States. And um, it's kind of interesting that um, for one thing, Castro was a, a, a big baseball fanatic. So baseball gets played a lot in the Caribbean. Love baseball. I think he actually, nah, don't quote me on this. I think he actually may have been a minor league baseball player in the United States for a while. So he loved baseball. And, at, and the United States actually was the first ones to support Castro when he came to power. Um, and so for a little bit, for a tiny bit of time, it looked like there was going to be this sort of amicable uh, relationship between the two. Uh, Castro, for various reasons, the United States, for various reasons, uh, definitely went their separate ways. But I guess I'd mention that to say that there was, there was a time in which this may have gone slightly differently than, than it did. But, uh, you know, Cuba became known as very anti-U.S. imperialism, and then I got very involved in the sort in the uh, Soviet orbit. Um, like I said, Santa Maria doesn't talk much about uh, Che Guevara or the Cuban revolution either. We talked a little bit about 
uh, Cuba when, we, when he talks about health and health care, and he does quote Guevara uh, during that part. Uh, it's not until way later on in the last part, and I think we'll read this for Monday, uh, that he talks about uh, the global impact of Castro and the, and the kind of, you know, he's, he was a meme before there were memes or, you know, Che Guevara and the Che Guevara t-shirts and Salvador Allende in, in Chile, that they have had impacts outside of simply Latin America, but all across the globe uh, so that they become these sort of uh, decontextualized from their, from their own, uh, from what they may have done in order to become uh, inspirational to other to people in other places. Now, so we have this whole uh, tradition in Latin America and the Caribbean of the, you know, the revolution and the resistance and the rebellion, the folk heroes, those examples to draw upon. But for the most part, a lot of the people who tried to do similar things or tried to fight for social justice or tried to implement some kind of uh, democratic socialism in their country uh, were only at most briefly successful and then became brutally uh, subjugated and oppressed and disappeared. And some of the truly worst human rights violations uh, have occurred uh, against the people who were trying to, to do something different. So actually, I want to start off, uh, Santa Bria starts us off in Central America, but I actually want to start us off in, in the so-called Southern Cone countries and talk about Chile. Uh, so Chile was uh, an interesting example because, you know, coming out of the 1960s, early 1970s, uh, they actually elected Salvador Allende. He won a popular election as you know, and wanted to implement more socialist policies, but he was not, it, it was not a, a military uh, move. It was a, a democratically elected, and, and Chile had a long tradition of democratic elections. And then uh, with the help of uh, the United States, uh, uh, Pinochet comes to power, basically, you know, crushes the, the, uh, the, the Allende and, and institutes, uh, some very uh, draconian, uh, what are called, we'll read about them for tomorrow, neoliberal economic reforms to sort of forcefully make Chile one of the most capitalistic market-friendly countries in the continent. So uh, pretty brutal oppression in Chile. Um, and similarly uh, in the Southern Cone country of Argentina, well, not similarly, a quite different situation. Uh, military rule uh, during the 1970s. So they had a, you know, some, you know, they had some back and forth. Was a lot of, a lot of democratic elections, but very populist elections, and then uh, a period of military rule in which there were a number of, uh, you might call them middle class, uh, urban uh, students who were trying to protest this rule, who then got disappeared by the government. You may remember the. Uh, the song I, I, I showed you uh, about the, the compulsory military service and some of the protests and, and how people were jailed for that or worse uh, in Argentina. So uh, was not, didn't have the same popular support of, of the Chilean. Uh, it wasn't a, but uh, some, of the, some of the more brutal uh, forms of disappearance and oppression under the military. And then, just to sort of continue the, the sadder stories of our continent and what we call Central America, um, you had uh, an, an attempted, or uh, I guess for a while successful uh, movement in Nicaragua led, the, they were called the Sandinistas. They actually came to power uh, under uh, Daniel Ortega. And then uh, that was around when uh, Ronald Reagan became president of the United States. Uh, they formed a counter movement that was trying to overthrow the Sandinistas. Things got really complicated. You may have heard of the Iran-Contra affair when certain people were uh, selling arms or 
I forget exactly what was happening. And, it, you know, talk about a need for a truth commission. They were, you know, selling things to Iran so that they could get arms to the, the Contras who were fighting against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua involving Honduras. Uh, not the best episode in, uh, in U.S. history either. Probably will never be uncovered in part because a lot of people got pardoned from that when uh, George H.W. Bush came to power. But, uh, you know, the story of uh, people trying to, uh, trying to implement something that might be more like socialism, the United States freaks out and has a counter-revolutionary movement, which uh, was something. Uh, El Salvador. Oh, another sad story. Actually, Lewis, you did us a little bit on El Salvador. What did you get out of that? Uh, because the king there, I can't remember if it was named, it was S-M-N-L, something like that. Right, yep, it. yep. Uh, I can't remember what it was the king exactly with the government. So the government was supported by the United States and the guerrillas were supported by, I think it was Cuba and some other country and the Soviet Union too. Uh, they were fighting for civil rights and they were being, the, the rich had like half of 1% on like 90% of the wealth in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. and that's what they wanted to change. Uh, children, lots of people, lots of people died in that scene. Mm -hmm. war. And uh, what else? I think that's. <laughs> I think that, that's that's a good summary of of basically what happened. You had a, a left leaning movement, a lot of influence from liberation theology, support from oh, yeah. uh, the yeah, church. Yeah. So and then you had these government led death squads going out and massacring people and indigenous people, and uh, you know it was uh, again not not the best moment uh, for. For the uh, for U.S. policy in the region, uh, similarly, uh, Guatemala, uh, you know, uh, basically a state controlled by, as Lewis just said about El Salvador, a tiny, uh, tiny and wealthy elite who considered themselves to be the true Guatemalans, the true white European Guatemalans, who basically unleashed the military uh, in a, you know, what. I guess we may as well just describe as an attempted genocide of the entire Maya descended population. Uh, again, often supported and trained, military people supported and trained uh, in the United States. So basically, I mean, as Sanabria says, and, and he used to end the book with this chapter, and I was like, man, you can't do that, Sanabria. It's too depressing. It's like, you know, it's like, you, this is what you're going to end with is these people just, you know, getting, getting massacred. Uh, oh yeah. More depressing stuff. So Santa Bria talks about what I have said, or, or might be the, the last guerrilla movements or armed insurrection movements uh, on the continent and maybe all around the world. So he discusses Colombia. And the long running, oh boy, how many years? 40, 45 years? I think it has finally, they finally reached something like a peace accord uh, with the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarios Colombianos, the armed revolutionary forces of Colombia, which were, uh, you know, said to be a kind of uh, revolutionary movement, but uh, ended up in and doing some other stuff we'll talk about. So these, that went on for a long period of time. There was also a, a very uh, violent uh, movement that arose in Peru called the Shining Path or the Sendero Luminoso, uh, which took a Maoist approach to revolution, which meant, at least in this context, it was, 
both brutally violent in the places that, that it controlled, but also there was sort of brutal repression against it. I would say that, you know, in, in, in Chile and Argentina, one can sympathize with Allende and the, the young revolutionaries and their idealism. And in Central America, you could definitely sympathize with the, 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 the Catholics and the indigenous population that was trying to fight for their rights. But really, it's hard to get much sympathy. There was not much that we could ever like about the FARC in Colombia. They ended up being uh, doing a lot of drug running, a lot of recruitment of child children to fight, um, just had basically seemed to have lost uh, any ideological commitment to a cause. I mean, I'm sure there were some people who still believed, but it seemed like it had just become a self-perpetuating uh, battle there. And certainly the Shining Path, as I mentioned, quite violent, quite repressive themselves. Uh, so, you know, I mean, unlike some of the solidarity movements, you know, U2 and Bruce Springsteen never gave benefit concerts for the Shining Path. I mean, those guys, uh, even the, I don't even think the, the, I don't even think the Cubans would have liked them. They're just sort of really kind of out there in terms of their their commitment to a, a very purist ideology, uh, and and I, I guess a, I would say a sort of self perpetuating cycle of violence. So what happens from all this? Like I said, for the most part, the United States always seemed to be, not always, but too many times, on the side of the, the reactionary or the military governments in the region. This was especially true in Chile, where, you know, it seems like uh, maybe not all the documents have been dug up yet, but it seems like they had some pretty high level contacts between Pinochet and the CIA. And certainly after the Chilean uh, dictatorship was established, he got a lot of support from uh, economists in Chicago, the University of Chicago, who were trying out their, as we'll read in the next section, their neoliberal economic policies there. Uh, I'm not sure how much we helped Argentina, but we certainly uh, were not always on the, the side of the people there. And as we talked about in Nicaragua, we decided to support this other armed group and prop them up and send in uh, counter-revolutionaries in El Salvador. We decided to prop up the government there. In Guatemala, we decided to, uh, oh, I think we, what did we do there? We overthrew an election and then we uh, supported and trained the people who were uh, involved in the, in the genocide there. So. Again, for the most part, uh, the United States placed themselves on the, on, on the side of the governments here uh, in Colombia because we're worried about all the coca that was cocaine that was coming into the country. We decided to fumigate vast areas of, of Colombia, uh, which then helped fuel in some ways the, uh, the FARC because they were benefiting from the drug trade and could help, could claim that they were on the anti-imperialist side against the United States. Uh, I think we, we also did support, again, I'm not trying to say that, that we should have been supporting the Shining Path, but our policies in Peru helped pave the way for a uh, counter, uh, a, a repressive military outcome there. The other thing that is, is true, especially when it comes to uh, places like Guatemala and El Salvador, I mean, people weren't necessarily even trying to choose sides in this conflict, but the, whatever, it wasn't, they, who, the people who, who sort of got, suffered the most from this uh, were often the people in rural communities or indigenous communities, which would simply be the military would, would would take on just because, you know, it might be the source of some of the people that they thought they were fighting against. Um, and we've seen this, this is something that happens in many different places around the world uh, where, you know, you, uh, the, if you have power or control, you go in and you try to eliminate everyone's scorched earth policy. 
Uh, so a lot of the people uh, who are uh, became displaced internally, uh, Colombia, for example, has one of the highest numbers of displaced people uh, in the Americas, in the world, um, and people who, who would come into the cities from the rural areas where these fights were occurring uh, in, and have sort of refugee status or, or, or try to have refugee status there. A lot of this happens, by the way, internally. Uh, we're going to talk about how what that happens internationally. But for example, in Colombia, it's a lot of people who are internally displaced. I talked about this with uh, the FARC, uh, but you know, a lot of the the sort of gang activity and and especially with the FARC, they became uh, they they often were uh, got payoffs for guarding the people who were who were. Uh, growing and processing cocaine, and then they'd use that payoff to fund the, the military operation. So like I said, not much to like about the FARC there, especially since some of this uh, parlayed into, uh, into some of the, the gang activities that we've seen in recent years. And one of the other outcomes here is that a lot of people from Guatemala, from El Salvador, from Nicaragua, ended up being internally displaced and then having, you know, basically having their livelihoods completely interrupted, either politically or economically, would try to uh, come through Mexico or somehow get out and come into the United States. And so, you know, I mean, a lot of people in the United States are like, well, those that even know they're from Central America, that many are just like ah, Mexicans. Uh, so first of all, uh, the United States has often a bad attitude about Mexicans, but you may remember uh, that there were these ideas, there were these caravans coming north and that you know we had to stop them. But of course, the thing is, is that those very immigrants were basically a cause or, I mean, were, were basically uh, put on that path because of the U.S. policies economically and politically in Central America. So, you know, it's this weird situation where we get upset that somebody from Guatemala has just come up here, but, you know, why is that person here? Often it's because, uh, at least indirectly, a result of U.S. support for the kind of scorched earth policy that made this uh, activity happen. So, in the 1990s, some of this sort of, uh, or a lot of the, the struggles for revolution uh, kind of took a, how to say, they went down, they took a backseat, they waned, they didn't, uh, they, they were less prominent. So in the 1990s, um, a number of things happened. One of them was the fact that, as you may know, in 1989 was basically the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall and the fall of, of the, the Soviet Union. And as we talked about, the, the end of the Soviet Union support of Cuba. Um, and so, you know, there, the idea that socialism or communism was going to lead us to a utopia for all was you know, was basically done for. Uh, there were no, there were very, there were a lot fewer countries that even claimed to be on the road to socialism, let alone having arrived. And so uh, both uh, academically uh, and in, in real life, the idea that socialism could give us uh, something better than what capitalism could uh, tended to, to drop out. Uh, in the 1990s. And I would mention that it's sort of ironic that, it, that nobody talks about socialism, especially during this time, because it, at the time, the, there was a tremendous divergence in the fates of the, the rich and the poor, just continuing uh, to this day. And so in some ways, back when Karl Marx was talking about how unequal things were and how they needed to have a revolution, um, you know, then in some ways, there was a there was a, a larger transfer, at least in the uh, 
in what we might call the first world countries, the creation of a middle class. Uh, but, uh, you know, and if we look around the world, uh, the, the inequalities are, are kind of back to the levels uh, when Karl Marx was first proposing his revolutionary struggle and, uh, for the workers. But now that we don't think socialism exists, no biggie. At the other, or I mean another factor in the, in the waning of, of revolutionary struggles is that many governments, I mean, even to a certain extent, including Guatemala, but certain, certainly Colombia and others, uh, develop new constitutions, uh, put into place more uh, democratic reforms or more support for uh, indigenous groups and wrote those into their constitutions and their governments. And so it's not a perfect thing, but a lot of countries kind of recognize that simply oppressing or trying to oppress the indigenous populations, we're not, a, we're not going to be a, a, a ticket for success in the future. Like I said, Colombia actually came out with a fairly progressive constitution. Uh, Ecuador uh, developed a systems of you know, trying to promote bilingual education in schools, for example. So there were a number of multicultural reforms in that place. Uh, the other thing that happened is after the, what was called in Latin America, the lost decade of the 1980s, uh, in the 1990s, there were some fairly large economic booms. Um, Brazil became a pretty big economic powerhouse during this time. I think their GDP might be the sixth or seventh in the world. Mexico uh, had a pretty large boom. And so oh, there, there was a lot of uh, economic growth during this period, which tended to dampen down the idea that, that you needed a, to have a, a socialist revolution in, in order to solve your economic problems. A lot of countries uh, became interlaced with tourism as a major source of wealth. And uh, if you're running a tourist economy, it's usually not good, <laughs> Lydia's laughing. It's not good to have a revolution going on. You don't want to host a dictatorship or have a coup. It's just not a pleasant thing to fly into when you're, you know, you want to see some Machu Picchu re ruins. You don't want to have a revolution on your hands and not be able to leave the airport. So on the one hand, it gives you money and that makes people happy. But on the other hand, it also tends to, uh, you know, people are like, yeah, we probably, maybe we should just uh, try to chill out on the whole having a revolution thing. Another interesting thing that happens is that instead of necessarily taking up arms, and some of the Zapatistas in Mexico did, they did actually take up arms, but a lot of them realized that that the fight wasn't necessarily on a battlefield, but it was about trying to mobilize public opinion to your cause. And so, you know, it was kind of like those t-shirts of Che Guevara, or the Zapatistas were really good at kind of mobilizing uh, public opinion, selling stuff, becoming a tourist destination in and of itself because you had, you were, you declared yourself an autonomous zone. So um, there was a kind of a, some of the movements uh, took this turn of realizing that, you know, maybe they could win more by not necessarily fighting it out, but more with, uh, you know, trying to mobilize international support. Um, I don't know. Hey, Gabe, how's the internet connection today? It's fine. It's fine. You saw a 12 minute recent video about Zapatistas. What'd you find out? Uh, it was most like when I, in my discussion post, I said like the majority was just like a recount of like, I think there were like three people interviewed in the video and mm -hmm. one was a journalist. Well, two were journalists and then one was a pastor and they all had like different encounters during the time. And then at the end, it was like, oh, and it's this fight is still on. Like literally in the last like 30 seconds, that was like the only thing about 
the revolution like in the present. Hmm. Did it seem uh how to say did it seem kind of slick to you like they were kind of you know producing a pretty good video for being all fighting the fight and stuff yeah <laughs> yeah they were good they're very good at me you know, like i said they're very good at the uh the their uh their press accounts they're mobilizing for uh for for to get the get on the good side of the youtubers so I think they were they were smart from the beginning at doing this, and so in some ways it took the took the focus off of the the armed rebellion or the full scale national strike to be able to uh, to go at different media like like now YouTube. And so in the in the two thousands, there was. Uh, what a lot of people called a leftward turn in Latin America. So this book was called The Resurgence of the Latin American Left. But it came not through, for the most part, it didn't come because of revolutions, it became, became because of uh, elections and the reinstitution of democracy. So in Brazil, you had uh, the famous election of, of, uh, of Lula, who was uh, at one point during the military dictatorship, and he was in jail as an organizing member of the Workers' Party. But then he becomes president. He becomes president of Brazil, and is and is widely praised for being so smart and growing and handling the economy. I think he may have then went back to jail for corruption, but that's the next slide. So um, yeah. Uh, so you had Brazil, where people from who were once in jail became president. Uh, same thing in, in Argentina and in Chile and Uruguay, you had uh, people who might have been, who were, uh, who, who, who had become famous as being resistors or even, uh, you know, the children of people who had been uh, persecuted back in the day, uh, you know, and come and, and become president and even have, uh, you know, even have socialism in their party names and get elected. And, you know, people are like, okay, that's cool. Ecuador, uh, one of the lesser known places, but had a, a kind of lefty turn uh, under uh, Korea in recent years. Um, more famous, of course, Venezuela under, uh, under Hugo Chavez and Bolivia under Evo Morales. Um, I don't know, some people would debate whether there were actually peaceful elections there, or if these were rigged. But in any case, you had this emergence of people who deliberately tied themselves to a more socialist alternative, uh, in the case of Bolivia, to indigenous uh, identity in ways that perhaps would have been unimaginable 20 or certainly a decade before and, and 20 or 30 years before as well. And so uh, Santa Bria talks here a little bit about, well, quite a lot actually, about this idea of transitional justice, which kind of, I think, comes to the fore in this idea of going back uh, during the 2000s when people were, were elected uh, and had overthrown some, or had, had peacefully uh, gotten rid of, of some of the military occupations and dictatorships, and were going to uh, do something to uh, to figure out what was or, or to to uh, address what had happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that period. Actually, Brandon, you talked about transitional justice a little bit. What do you get out of that? Let's see if he's there. Uh -huh. I am here. Sorry. Um, yeah, I talked about uh, transitional justice, and I was just like, I was trying to really like look for like, because like the chapter to me was kind of like confusing, so yeah. I was kind of like looking for like uh, something to talk about. So I landed on like transitional justice, and uh, it said like uh, before it, it's kind of the search for justice, and the truth is one way to uh, the injured to uh, try and find closure, and so like traditional justice refers to the process of readdressing past wrongs committed in states shifting from a violent authoritarian past toward a more liberal democratic future. 
Yeah, sounds good. So, yeah, I mean, this is what kind of happens, like I said, in the 2000s where, you know, I mean, people were elected. They were trying to become more democratic. Times had changed, but they didn't want to sort of, you know, again, as we saw, you don't want to forget the people who are absent, who were disappeared. And so they set up truth commissions. They were trying to kind of figure out what happened to remember, but also to have some closure with that period. Uh, interestingly, forensic anthropology comes in in different ways, for example, in Guatemala to kind of find the, the uh, they were used to, to find the, the, an the ancestry or the identity of people who were massacred by the government. So there was, there was kind of a, a burgeoning uh, of forensic anthropology techniques in Guatemala and Argentina um, as well. Um, some of the probably best forensic anthropologists come from there because they're trying to identify victims of massacres or genocide. So uh, I think, Brendan, you're right that this chapter is very confusing. I've tried to put it in a slightly different order than Santa Bria does because I think it's important to understand kind of the, uh, the influence of the Mexican and Cuban revolution and then go into some of the uh, what was happening in Chile and Argentina, and then go into Central America, in part because that's more chronological, but also because uh, I, I think it helps make a little bit more sense of, of this perhaps chaotic period. But I think you're absolutely correct that it's confusing, and it's confusing to figure out what's going on now when we look at this area because we talked about how there were military dictatorships and then there were protests and there were counter protests and, and the, the sort of ins and outs of that politics. And then you had this whole leftward turn in Latin America in the 2000s. And when I look at Latin America and Caribbean countries right now, and again, it's trying to make sense of what's going on. To me, there seems to be this uh, a, a kind of back and forth between you'll have a leftward leaning government for four years or eight years, and then you'll have a rightward leaning government. And that can make it very difficult to govern a country. And so Chile, if I look at Chile, for example, they had a leftward and then they went to a rightward and then the leftward person was reelected. Same thing in Argentina, you had a left wing and then a right wing, and then the left wing run, won the election. And, and as soon as they won that, election, the stock market dropped by 60%. So it was like, you know, and then I think that things have gone, same thing in Brazil. Like I said, you had this person who was in jail, then he becomes president. I think he then had to go back to jail for a while. So, you know, and now Brazil has, has a person who has styled himself as the Trump of the tropics. You may have heard of him. Uh, first, he was you know, basically supporting the burning of the Amazon. And then he claimed that the coronavirus vaccine might turn him into an alligator. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to govern a country when you have this back and forth. Bolivia, same thing. You have uh, Evo Morales in power. Then people claim that he was falsely stealing power. Then they had a kind of uh, maybe a coup against him or engineered by the right wing and his party, but then they had an election and put other people back in. Uh, this may sound familiar because it's kind of in a similar way been happening in the United States, perhaps to a less dramatic thing. But when you think about, if you go back in time, you had Ronald Reagan and then you had George H.W. Bush or Bush one. He goes over and gets replaced by Bill Clinton for a while. Then you have Bush too, or the son of Bush. Then you went from there over to Obama. Then you had Trump. Then you had Biden. So, you know, I mean, it's, a, you know, a lot of me, you may be reading about how many executive actions Biden has been taking. But, you know, all of these people basically came into office and issue a bunch of executive actions to get rid of the or to sort of roll back the stuff that their predecessor did. And then when the other person comes in, they just reverse all of that again. So uh, this is actually a policy that has implications in Latin America. It's sometimes called the global gag rule, which is, um, you know, that, that U.S. funding, uh, it was, a, a, I think it was an amendment. It was, 
basically by executive order that the US cannot provide funding to any agency that even mentions the possibility of having uh, of abortion as a means of, 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 of women's uh, reproductive health and reproductive justice. And so uh, I think this policy emerged under Reagan, was, uh, was perpetuated under uh, uh, George H.W. Bush. When Clinton came in, he got rid of it. Then uh, I was watching the inauguration of George W. Bush and the first thing he did was sign up an executive order to put that back in. And then Obama gets rid of it. And then Trump reinstates it. And now Biden has got rid of it again. So, I, I, you know, it makes it, it makes it hard. And the people who are oftentimes the most affected are people who have nothing to do with these political transitions at all. The other thing that, you know, and it's sometimes, again, difficult to keep up. I don't want to say that all these things are happening right now because sometimes you'll have a huge protest. For example, there was a huge protest in Chile, uh, in Santiago, that basically destroyed, I remember, the subway system a couple years ago. Um, and, you know, then there's, there, in Argentina, as I mentioned, there was this election which had uh, huge uh, effects uh, monetarily, economically. Um, Venezuela has been in what seems like perpetual crisis, uh, lots of immigration out of Venezuela into Colombia, into Brazil, into other places. Um, Bolivia, we talked about there back and forth. There were some huge demonstrations in Ecuador uh, about a year and a half ago. They had to move the whole government to the coast for a while. Uh, Peru has had uh, its share of street demonstrations. It also had a, has had an enormous bout with COVID-19, just a really devastating uh, blow to, to Peru in this time. Uh, Nicaragua, uh, so Daniel Ortega from the Sandinistas uh, came back into power, but seems to have taken a very authoritarian turn, not being nice at all. And so, you know, I don't think anybody, at least uh, people that might have been on his side in the old days, uh, do not seem to be very supportive of him. So I'm not trying to say that all these places are, are in crisis uh, continuously, uh, but this sort of left-right polarization and, and gyration is something that is happening in Latin America and is perhaps happening uh, United States as well. So if you may remember from back in the day, what I'm trying to do in this course is talk to you about themes that happen across the Americas and how we can in some ways understand US what's happening in the United States or America uh, in comparison and in tandem with what is happening uh, in the Americas in general. So this is actually, I pulled this picture up from Bogota, the capital of Colombia. This is the uh, Palacio de Justicia or the Palace of Justice, which would be the equivalent of our Supreme Court. And in 1985, a guerrilla movement in Colombia called M19 took over the Supreme Court in Bogota in a daring attack. And then the military went in and this is called the retaking of the Palacio de Justicia, where they basically went in. It ended up in the, the death of, perhaps, I think half of, of, basically half of the Supreme Court died in the retaking of it. So it was a, it was a terrible and dark uh, episode in Colombian uh, history here because the military just crashed in. I'm not saying the M19 were the good guys here, but they certainly got crushed along with uh, the people who were on the court as well. And so this is actually a very famous picture uh, in the American news as well. This is often recirculated as, you know, this idea of this is what's happening in Bogota. And so Latin American capitals have become known for, right, this sort of protest and taking over storming government buildings to the extent that recently, about a few weeks ago, I think it was, uh, the um, Jake Tapper, I think he's from CNN tweeted out that, I feel like I'm talking to a correspondent reporting from Bogota. So here he is, he's, we're watching these images in the US Capitol and he says, 
I'm in Bogota, you know, which is this, and, and a lot of journalists said, I feel like I'm in some place in Latin America. And interestingly, or, you know, many people responded, you know, this guy was one of my favorites. He's like, hey, I live in, I'm a correspondent in Bogota. We haven't had anything like this happening here for 30 years, but let you know if anything happens. And so, I mean, in some sort of, like I said, I don't want to convey the impression that, that things in Latin America are constantly in crisis because if you go into Bogota today, it's, you know, a wonderful capital city and people are doing their Bogota things. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the idea that, that in some ways we in the United States are insulated from this, these, these kinds of things, I think we're, we're starting to understand that, uh, that we, we are not and that these have been processes or themes that have occur occurred in